back. We are live on Barro, Colorado Island, and we have with us some very special guests, all of you included. We are really delighted that people are joining us from several continents today. We have people joining us with classrooms with 25 or 30 students, and we have people who are logged in uh, on their own as well. So we have some, some great diversity in terms of the numbers of people and where they're located, and we rely on your questions during our live online events, and we hope you'll join in in the chat, as so many of you did during our last session here live from Panama. So um, one quick note, how to chat. There's a box over on the left side of the screen, uh, and you can use that Q&A box to type in questions as we go along. Um, we also love for you to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. So feel free to use that chat box right now to tell us a little bit about you. Uh, we will know where you are since you already entered that on your way into the room, but perhaps you can tell us if you're gathered with a group or what your interest in today's topic will be. Don't forget, our sessions today are brought to us uh, by the Smithsonian and our gracious hosts here at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute and by Microsoft Partners in Learning and Taking It Global. So thanks to all of uh, the very many people who are part of making these events possible. My name is Jonathan, by the way, and I'm delighted to be here uh, in Panama as your host and looking for all of your questions as we go along. So I will do my best to bridge your questions to our guests as we go along. And don't forget, if you have questions even after the event takes place or would like to keep up with Shout, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Shout Learning or on Facebook at Shout Learning. Um, and you can uh, keep up with all the latest events and ways to participate as you explore, connect, and act uh, as it relates to the environment around all of us. We're also closed captioning today's event, and you'll find that at the bottom part of the screen. Um, and uh, we hope that's a useful tool for all of you. If for any reason you need to turn off the captions, they are on by default. Uh, you can use the little pull-down menu where our colleagues at WGBH are listed. You can change WGBH to no captions, and that'll turn the captions off. All right. So that is the, um, the a little bit. We're also, I wanted to point out, we are also capturing today's session in the form of, of a virtual illustration. I'm going to give you a quick sneak peek of our scrap. Our scribe is going to be capturing everything that's being said uh, and organizing it, I should say, in the form of an, an illustration. And so sure enough, we already see the, uh, the beginning of that illustration appearing on our screen. And we'll check in with our scribe um, as we go along or perhaps at the end and see how, uh, how the session has come together in the form of that graphic. So thank you to our friend um, and scribe today. All right. Excellent. So in just a moment, we're going to go ahead and introduce our guests. I did want to point out one last thing, which is that we have a special guest joining us. You're going to meet Dr. David Pearson from Arizona, Arizona State University in a little while, and you see him on your screen uh, just below the view from the balcony here um, in, uh, uh, in Panama. And we'll uh, leave uh, David up on the screen with us throughout. So David, if you think of anything you'd like to jump in and say even before, um, we turn to you officially, don't hesitate to wave and get our attention, and uh, we'll turn on the speakers here on the balcony so that uh, Tony and Sharon can hear you as well. And speaking of Tony and Sharon, I'm bringing them up on your screen right now. Um, you heard uh, Tony give the introduction a little bit earlier, uh, uh, and um, he is the staff scientist emeritus and was the deputy director here at STRI uh, for 10 years, I believe, uh, and knows this place perhaps better than, uh, than anybody. Um, and Sharon Ryan is the Public Programs Director um, here at the Smitho Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute and has been uh, a gracious host as well. Thank you so much for having us and for leading us through desert to rainforest today. I'm going to turn the floor over to both of you. Great. Well, thank you for inviting us, Jonathan. Um, as you can see, you've looked around a little bit. We're here in the middle of a hot, humid rainforest um, on Battle, Colorado. And um, we're surrounded by lush vegetation. And you can hear birds chirping in the background. Um, we're also in the middle of the Panama Waterway Canal, which is one of the most important waterways in the world. So it's easy here in this setting to think about um, and to contemplate what water means for life, history, for the culture, uh, not only of Panama, but for the world. Water here, just like everywhere, is, is important and it's vital to sustaining plants, animals, and wildlife. Um, what scientists like to refer to as biodiversity. 
Uh, water, and that's the same, it's vital whether we're talking about a small stream that's flowing through a desert arid landscape or if we're talking about a, a heavy tropical downpour here in the rainforest where much of the world's uh, species are concentrated. So biodiversity then and water are very interconnected. Uh, scientists tell us that a loss of biodiversity, for example, can have very severe impacts on the quality of life support systems. And we're talking about watersheds, air quality, as well as rainfall. Um, and science also tells us that the more species there are in any given area, the more plants, animals, and other life forms, um, the more able that area is to resist destruction and the more able it is to better perform sort of very vital environmental functions. And that's anything from enriching the soil to cleansing water to stabilizing climate to even generating the air, the oxygen that we breathe. Water then sustains us all. We know this. People, places, plants, animals. It also plays a very large role in the economy and um, cultures of the world and perhaps nowhere more so than here in Panama. Panama is both a passageway and a reservoir of biodiversity for the world. And Panama has a very rich culture, um, it has a very rich history, and also has very important links with the United States. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those links and some of the ways that water influences life and the history here in Panama. But right now we're going to try and transport you to a very, very different place um, where water, or lack of it in this case, has very instrumental and fundamental impacts on life and shaping of culture there as well. Um, Dave, perhaps we can bring you into the conversation at this point. Yes, uh, we've we've got a nice partnership going with uh, Smithsonian there at Stry and ASU. We're we're having a lot of fun. I have sometimes problems explaining to people what in the world do deserts have to do with rainforests and why are you hooking up with a, such a different habitat? But that's part of what we're going to talk about today and hopefully we'll, we'll solve, resolve that, uh, that question as to what do deserts have to do with rainforests and water is a real key issue there. Sharon? Um, actually, it's Dave. Dave is going to talk, talk to us a bit about the desert, or we're we going to do our bird question. <laughs> that, uh, whatever comes first here. I can go right out the desert if you want. Anyway, okay. No, let's, let's, so hold on, David, one second. We've got this bird, and uh, he's got a big question mark on his back, which probably means we're wondering what kind of bird this could possibly be. Yeah, maybe those of you out in the audience can talk to us a little bit about, uh, have a guess of what kind of bird you might think this is. And all you need to do to issue your guest is to type it into the box on the left side of the screen. We're starting to get some responses. The early votes that are coming in are that this might be a toucan. Um, the group based uh, with Mary Beth in Chicago thinks that it's a toucan. Um, that seems to be unanimous. Right. Are they correct? They're absolutely right. It's a keel-billed toucan. Um, just to let you know, the questions are going to get a little harder as we go on throughout <laughs> the presentation. <laughs> All right. That's okay. That's and uh, also looking at this, this is kind of representative of, of the number of birds in Panama is spectacular. And we're going to compare that to how many birds are in Arizona and look at some differences. It's really easy to see the differences. But here we have, what in the world does this desert have to do with a rainforest? But you look at some of these plants and animals and you start to think about what do they all have to have in common. Every plant and animal that lives in the desert has to have something in common to be able to survive. What are they fighting for? Can anybody guess what they're fighting for? Every plant and animal that lives in the desert has to fight day and night for it. What do you think it is? Well, looks like some people are... <laughs> the early responses here are unanimous. It looks like some people are coming up with, with water, and uh, that's certainly a, a really big part of it. And how does water compare here in the desert? You look at these, you look at these big, tall saguaro plants, and they have all kinds of specialized, what we call adaptations for storing water. And they only occur in the Sonoran Desert. They occur nowhere else in the world but in these deserts. And they have to have all kinds of, of these adaptations to be able to gather what little water comes by. It's dry most of the year. We only get six inches of rain here in, in the Phoenix area. And anybody living here has to do really well. Things like the Gila Monster. 
totally adapted. They spend almost all of their year, 10 months or more, underground because it's so dry. They only come up during the moisture times of the summer and they do a, a little bit of searching for mates, a little bit of eating, and they go back down underground. That's how they survive. Highly specialized. And you think, well, every species of plant and animal in the desert has to be so specialized, but then things start to get a little bit different. We start to see some strange things going on. This is a collared peccary or javelina. And here you can see, of course, it's coming to the water in Arizona, but it occurs all the way down into Panama and down into South America. How in the world can a desert species that needs water, how can it occur in the desert, survive very well in the desert, but also do well in the rainforest and get all the way down to South America? Strange thing. Uh, we have actually quite a few species that occur here in Arizona that also occur there in Panama. When Sharon is talking, I can hear in the background a tropical kingbird singing. We have the same species right here in Arizona. Yes, we have lots and lots of desert adapted species, but there are some species that just go on and on and on. What is it about these species? Can anybody think of any other species that has even a wider range, can occur from deserts to mountain forests to the coldest parts of the world? What's another species that really has a wide, wide range, even wider than these collared peccaries? Anybody have a guess? Okay, maybe coyotes and foxes, they don't quite get as far, but I'm thinking about it even a species that occurs in, in uh, Europe, in Asia, in Africa, it occurs in the Arctic tundra. Yeah, someone, Darren Milligan got it. Human beings, absolutely. And how do we do it? There are things like this black Phoebe that can occur in a long, long ways uh, from deserts to, to Panama, but they're really restricted to water. They're nowhere as, as versatile as human beings for occurring in a wide range of habitats. Even though it's just shared with Panama and Arizona, this black Phoebe has got very specific habitats and doesn't occur uh, in a lot of variation except the long streams. But look what happened here in Arizona. Way, way back, a thousand years ago, the ancient Hohokam people, the native people living here, took the river and they diverted lots of water into surrounding land with these canals. And they were able to survive very, very well with a, a very rich, abundant agriculture for more than 12 or 1300 years. Human beings are really good at occurring a lot of places by manipulating water, by manipulating their habitat, things that other animals can't do. We're so good at it, we can occur everywhere. And look, here is the remains of a Hohokam Canal. Even today, we can still see them. And what have we done? Modern Phoenix has taken the very same canals that the Hohokam people built thousands of years ago, and we made them our own canals. We're taking these ancient people's engineering abilities and using them for our own benefits. We've come a long, long way, and human beings have been extremely important in doing that. I was wondering, Sharon, uh, do you have any canals there in Panama? And where is water more important? Is water more important in the desert or is water more important in the rainforest? Here is Phoenix today. Look at that. We are totally dependent on water. Does that mean water is more important for us than you in Panama? For sure, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, it, it's definitely important for sustaining biodiversity and has had a, a major role in economy and cultures and life around the world. Um, it's interesting to hear about some of the similarities that you talked about between the species that are there in the desert and the species that are here in um, Panama as well. Uh, perhaps the greatest area of contrast would be in the sheer diversity of plant and animal life that takes place here in uh, Panama. And one of the ways that we've tried to illustrate this a little is by using this graph that shows, you know, a map of the large area covered by the United States and comparing that a little to the tiny space uh, in the world that Panama takes up, but just looking at the incredible staggering level of biodiversity here. Um, we can see that looking, um, we're just waiting for that to come up here, but um, just for example, if we look at the number of bird species that have been recorded in the United States, it uh, looks like we're close to about 900 um, in that whole area on the map there. And if you look at uh, down just below the map to the right of Panama, this little small area, there's been almost a thousand birds recorded here, different species since 2010. And um, 
uh, if we look at tree species as well, as well, and in this case, the map should be of all of North America because um, there's about a thousand different tree species that have been recorded in all of North America. But if you look at Panama, again, um, we're looking at about 2,300 different species. And I've also read somewhere that um, scientists, every time they go out to sort of update a survey, they find more species. So it's an ongoing discovery. Um, and it's just staggering the amount of biodiversity that takes place here. If we look at some of the other plants and animals um, in our next slide, um, we can see here that we have just a wide variety. There's millions of insect species here that have been, I've read estimates from 10 to 30 million different kinds of insects that you can find. Um, the area is, there are big cats prowling the jungles around here. We have five different species from jaguars to ocelots. There's jaguarundis, margays, and pumas as well here in Panama. We also have an abundance of bat species. Um, they make up over half of the amount of mammal species that are here. And here on Bado, Colorado, there's five species of monkey as, monkeys as well, and these occur throughout Panama too. Um, you can see here this is a little white-faced um, monkey or capuchin. Um, if we look again at some of the plant species, um, which is on our next slide, we're looking at up to 10,000 different varieties of plants living here in Panama. Um, and again, around the amphibians, and we've talked about birds. The birds here, there's almost a thousand different species, and they're the most abundant in all of Central America. And beautiful butterflies, over 1,500. So as you can see, just looking at the diversity of plant and animal life here, it's staggering. And um, I'm hoping Tony will be able to shed some light on how that's come to be. Um, and, and just one quick we note, Sharon, okay. apparently you're doing your job as public programs director very well because we have a number of people in the chat who are already saying, I want to go. Oh, great. Can <laughs> they visit? <laughs> Can they visit uh, Stry? Yes. Uh, yeah. It's, we have public programs that take place here on Brado, Colorado Island. Um, we also have several other sites throughout Panama, including uh, a nature center at Punta Calebra, which is close to Panama City. And in that site, we have a number of marine programs as well that kids can, uh, or adults and visitors and tourists can come and take part. And um, in some cases, get a chance to interact with real scientists who are out doing this work of discovery and, and sharing that knowledge. So yes, please come on down. In fact, we have over 100,000 visitors to Punta Calibra, right. which about yeah. 35,000 are Panamanian school children um, actually Absolutely. doing programs integrated into their curriculum by our association with the Ministry of Education. So um, it's a it's a very uh, well-crafted program for both young people and um, the average visitor. Yeah, and in fact, I'd just like to say that this Desert to Rainforest project is actually um, a teacher training and middle school learning experience project. So this is the kind of information and materials that we'll be bringing out to schools both in the United States and urban areas in Phoenix and here in Panama as well. So this is a test run. <laughs> All right. Thank you both. So Tony, maybe now is the chance you can uh, for you to an opportunity to tell us a little bit about um, how all this amazing diversity came to be. Well, to do that, we're going to have to go back in time a little bit and uh, a little bit of deep time. And if uh, we can make the next slide go forward, which I apparently can't anymore, but uh, yes, I can. There we go. Um, Panama didn't always exist. And uh, North America was separated from South America um, probably three, four million years ago. And when that occurred, or when that was the case, the map of the world in our part, at least in our part of the world, looked a little bit like the slide you can see there. And uh, there's a little bit of doubt about exactly which currents went where, but it seems to be the consensus of people that there was a sort of milling about of current. So it was a weak current coming in from the Pacific and perhaps some kind of countercurrent from the Caribbean. But at all events, what we now know as the Gulf Stream, which is the big current that flows up the eastern United States, um, was a weak current at that time. And there was a simple, single tropical ocean that stretched all the way from California to Caracas. I've collected actual coral species that are identical, um, that are five-ish million years old, uh, from a formation called the Emperor of Limestone in, in California and, what, and a similar formation in Caracas, Venezuela. So this was a, an ocean that had similar temperatures, similar salinity, saltiness, and um, 
uh, was fairly uniform across the whole area. Now, if you move to the next slide, you'll see that when the isthmus actually formed, it changed the world. It's, it, it's the last great dramatic global change event um, about three or four million years ago. And it actually set up an experiment. Um, I wasn't joking when I said Darwin would have loved it. This is a, an experiment from the biological standpoint, which would be a perfect Darwinian experiment to see if Darwin's theory of evolution works. But in fact, it's a fundamentally important issue to do with water and to do with biodiversity. Because look what's happened. On the Caribbean side, there being no flow of water through to the Pacific, the, the current is forced to go northwards as a strong Gulf stream. And what happens is that the region that we now know as the Caribbean was created at this time. It was created because the temperature went up of the seawater. Um, because there's the trade winds blowing steadily from the Caribbean to the Pacific, it's evaporating truly humongous quantities of water from the surface of the Caribbean and dumping it in the Pacific. The result is that the Caribbean becomes more salty and dense. And um, there's no upwelling from the bottom water, so it's actually low in nutrients. That's why it's so beautifully clear. It's why you love to scuba dive. It's why tourism is so rampant. And what is it? It's a perfect environment for the development of coral reefs, and they spread all over the Caribbean. On the other hand, on the Pacific side, all this fresh water is making the temperature cooler, uh, and that same wind that is blowing across the isthmus is pushing um, water, uh, the surface water of the Pacific, westwards. And so, um, just if we go to the next slide, you could see that on the Caribbean side, the coral reef systems, which of course grow from the bottom upwards, are the, the most diverse ecosystem in the world. So if we're talking about biodiversity, there was created, due to the, the rise of the isthmus, um, conditions in the Caribbean that produced phenomenal, what is what biologists call benthic biodiversity, biodiversity living on the bottom, coral reefs, which then create protected areas behind them that are called seagrass meadows, and those meadows graze, grade excuse me, shoreward into mangroves. That's the world's wet zones for the tropics, and it's uh, an area that um, protects and allows to grow as juveniles a vast array of, um, of species, many of which become commercially valuable fish um, to the exterior. If we go on to the next slide, however, here's the situation on the western side of the isthmus, where the trade winds are blowing the surface water westwards, as you can see from the arrows. And since they can't now cut, be replaced by water from the Caribbean, uh, it has to well up from the bottom. And that bottom water is cold and very rich in nutrients. And look what happens when that happens. The world goes crazy in the water column, and gazillions of anchovies are generated. And those anchovies provide fantastic amounts of food for all the fish, the tuna, the rays, the billfish, the sharks, the whales, and of course on top of that, a vast array of seabirds. And so you get this picture um, where um, the life, the, the diversity of life, unlike on the coral side, was actually in the water column in the form of fish. So that's, that's some of the results or, or the impact on biodiversity of the rise of the isthmus. One other one that's not so obvious is seen in this slide, um, whereby the closure of the isthmus creates the Gulf Stream, but the repercussions, the downstream repercussions of that is that the Gulf Stream meets very cold water in the, in the north, in, in the northern Atlantic, um, the cold water coming from the Atlantic, uh, excuse me, from the Arctic, and, is, and since it's denser, it sinks like a stone, and it flows back down through the, 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 the Atlantic, and in fact triggers an entire conveyor belt of currents, which are the present-day circulation of the oceans. And that, which occurred about three to four million years ago, created the modern climate and the modern world. On this diagram, if you look carefully, the pink part of the curve is where the current is at the surface, and the blue is where is it at depth. And so the, the one little rise of the Isthmus of Panama not only 
transform biodiversity and of course water distribution uh, locally in the form of the Caribbean and the Eastern Pacific, but it in fact affected the water circulation in the marine realm of the entire world. And that had consequences to climate in Africa and may even actually have influenced the evolution of human beings um, by reducing the amount of tropical rainforest and increasing the amount of savanna. And so all these primates were forced to go down on the ground in Africa and contend with all the predators and maybe the smartest intelligent cooperating groups survive and we call those hominids or homo sapiens. Okay, we move on now to um, what was going on on land and, and there is this huge event which took place about 2.8 million years ago when North America was joined to South America. So this this creation of Panama not only profoundly changed the world by separating two oceans and affecting water circulation and biodiversity, it vastly changed um, biodiversity on land also. And it did it in two steps, two phases. The first is, of course, that all the South American animals migrated north and all the North American animals migrated south. I've just put a picture here of the mammals. Obviously, things like bats, birds, and things that fly, and fish, they can, they can get across from one continent to another uh, without a land connection. But these animals that you see in, this, in the slide here, they have to walk on land. So if these guys migrate from one continent to the other, you know there was a very well-established land bridge. And in fact, we're talking, um, if, if you move to, if you look at this next slide, we're talking about 17 families of mammals going to South America and 19 families of mammals going to North America. Now, the reason it's easy to tell this picture apart is that the mammals in South America were completely different to the mammals in North America. They were, in fact, in South America, what we know as marsupials, which are, as you know from your studies in Australia and so forth, you know that these are uh, mammals in which the young is born more prematurely and is cared outside the body of the mother, whereas in placental mammals, which are the ones that live in native to North America, the, the embryo lives much longer within the mother and uh, presumably has a better chance of survival. So there's this vast, what is called the great American biologic interchange, which is Scientists call it Gabby amongst themselves. <laughs> and what it does is dramatically change the biodiversity of life in both North and South America. Um, it's a funny sort of result. It's, if you think of it as a soccer match, um, the, the North wins by about nine goals to one over the South. And that is because 64% of all the mammals in South America today come from North America originally, and only three species of animal survive in North America that come from the South. The hedgehog, the armadillo, can anyone think of the third marsupial that lives in North America? Go ahead and use the chatter and let us know. Here they come. Uh, a possum. And the possum, yeah. And in fact, the possum is doing so well, I think it just reached Minnesota. You know, <laughs> anybody who's silly enough to migrate from Panama all the way to Minnesota um, <laughs> must be out of their mind. I mean, it's so cold and so variable in climate, but the possum apparently just is doing extremely well. So um, nevertheless, it, the possum is only one of three that finally survived. Now, um, the first step in this exchange brought some extraordinary animals um, in, into the exchange. Now, you're familiar with the camels and the horses and the bears and the mice and the carnivores, etc., of the north, but you maybe not so much of the marsupials from the south. Here, for example, on my slide, is an 18-foot-tall giant sloth, which you can see, cut by comparison to the human figure, was a pretty big animal. It's interesting, even President Jefferson who was a paleontologist and had a paleo lab in the White House, thought that these things, he found fossils in a 
place called Bone Lick in Virginia, and he was sure that these fossils were so beautifully preserved, these animals must be roaming around somewhere. So when Lewis and Clark set off from St. Louis to cross the Rockies, they got a letter from President Jefferson saying, please be on the lookout for these giant sloths. Um, I need one for my uh, collection. Needless to say, uh, they didn't find any, but because uh, they went extinct um, a million or two years ago. Another sort of animal that would get your attention is this one, which is a giant predatory bird called Titanus walleri, or the terror bird as we affectionately know him as. Rip your head off very comfortably with that. Uh, but the trouble is that when he came into contact, she came into contact with all these uh, little mammal creatures, um, what do mammals love to eat? Eggs. And what does this bird have to lay in order to reproduce? Pretty large eggs. Probably a lot of mammals had some very good breakfasts on these legs. And uh, hence the giant predatory bird, which is found fossil in Florida and Texas, um, uh, also went extinct. Of course, it was a two-way traffic. Things like this mastodon went south. And uh, uh, in the end, what however, fundamentally changed biodiversity, interesting though the first wave of placentals and marsupials was, was what happened when the dust had settled from that great interchange. Because then if you look on the slide I have in front of you, you'll see that North America lies entirely outside the tropics. I've drawn in the top of the tropics in that dotted line, the Tropic of Cancer. And you can see that the whole of the tropics uh, embraces um, of course, South America and the Amazon, which is where fantastic biodiversity lies. So what is going to happen when you join North to South America? The northern fauna is not going to come south because it's out of its um, climatic range. But the Amazonian fauna is just going to migrate northwards because it's still in the tropics. And so Panama and Central America gets bathed in this fantastic, rich Amazonian biodiversity. So this is when all our parrots and butterflies and all the fantastic array of animals that we know here in Panama and in the rest of Central America. So you can see then that the rise of the Isthmus of Panama, even on land, dramatically affected the increase and in spread of biodiversity throughout Central America. Smithsonian doing in Panama. And of course, post facto, after the event, we discovered the reasons I've just shown you about um, comparing the sea on either side of the barrier and the land that was connected by the barrier, that it is in fact a fantastic place to work uh, because it's a perfect natural experiment, a Darwinian experiment that has been going for about three to four million years. But in fact, the serendipitous reason why Panama is the place that the Smithsonian ended up in has to do with what it's most famous for probably is the Panama Canal. And as you can see there on this slide, there are the, is the gantry uh, that was put in place when the building of the Panama Canal was uh, underway and they had reached the stage of building the locks. Now, that wasn't always in the plans because um, de Lesseps, the Frenchman, and the early uh, planning by the United States thought that they would just dredge a canal from the Pacific to the Atlantic um, at sea level. And it was, um, it was the luck that the United States had, or the smartness, whichever way you look at, look at it, to, to point three men who each in turn were perfect um, people for the job at the time they came. The first was uh, Dr. Gorgas, who, unlike the French, figured out that mosquitoes were what was killing everybody through yellow fever, dengue, and malaria. And so they went in first and cleaned out all of the uh, areas with standing water, and they took every infected person, put them in a glass cage, and burnt their clothes. Within a year or two, all of the fevers disappeared down to very normal. Without that, white uh, engineers and workers particularly would have been very prone to 
uh, what happened to the French engineers, and that is dying within weeks of coming to Panama. The second stage was the building of the canal, and that was done by an engineer called John Stevens. And John Stevens was brilliant for two reasons. One, he was the a railroad engineer, and he figured out that cutting a gap through the the short gap, it's only 10 miles long, between through the mountains of Panama to get from the Pacific to the Caribbean, was a problem of getting a, of disposing of the debris, not of excavation. And so he put in place a special railroad system that carried all the debris away and made uh, connections and causeways and coastline. Um, and one of the questions you might get asked is, if we piled all of that debris around the world, how many times would it go? And uh, you, we might see what what the answer is to that. And so it's a great deal of debris. And we're bringing up that uh, poll question right on the screen of our, our colleagues joining us from uh, around the world. And okay. Let's find out what they have to say. So if all the material that was originally excavated to build the Panama Canal were put on a train of flat cars, how many times would that train encircle the Earth? Um, interesting, we have some people on the very high end of the scale. Uh, okay, even distribution, I shouldn't be, I think my, my commentary is influencing the, <laughs> the result. Um, we're netting out with most people thinking uh, the plura plurality of our voters think it's, uh, it's uh, four times. Would they be correct? They would. Amazing. So the majority was, was smart enough to get it right, it, it would go around four times. Okay, so that, that was the, the engineering excavation sort of uh, problem solved, and John Stevens was brilliant at that. Um, for reasons we don't know, he suddenly threw a fit, resigned, and walked off the job. And, and uh, that led uh, President Teddy Roosevelt to appoint a, an electrical engineer who was uh, in the military and couldn't resign. Cause the president was actually pretty mad that the civilian had walked off the job. And uh, so this new guy was perfect because the excavation issues were solved, but now how were we going to build the locks and the, the, the mechanical system? And some of you may not know that the Panama Canal was the very first large civil engineering project that used electricity. And in fact, General Electric was created in order to bid for the contract uh, to, uh, for the Panama Canal. And so, uh, um, the gentleman's name was Gertels, and he came on board and ran the whole place like a military man should, in perfect order and perfect discipline. And um, can you imagine this gigantic federal project finished under budget and on time. <laughs> also probably the last time anything such has ever happened. Um, but what I want to mention is the, the last thing that John Stevens did, or one of the, 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 the crucial things that he did, was to say, there's no way we can build this canal from sea level to sea level. We have to um, create a lake. So they created this vast lake called Lake Gatun by damming the Chagres River at the mouth um, and raising the lake to be 85 feet above sea level. It was at the time the largest lake, artificial human-made lake in the world. But the creation of that lake was what stimulated Smithsonian scientists to say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on ecologically down in Panama? Is the, is, is the, pack, is the Pacific side of the isthmus the same as the Caribbean? Um, are, are species going to go extinct if we make this lake? And so they came down, they decided that they needed an expedition to examine um, what was going on. The secretary of the Smithsonian agreed, wrote to President Taft, Taft got a William reply Taft, the yeah. same afternoon in a hand typewritten letter, last time that that's probably ever happened <laughs> from the White House, and um, came down to Panama. And a, a very nice thing happened. Not only were they blown away by the fact that they discovered a biodiversity, the sort of um, thing that Sharon was talking about earlier, which is so much greater than you see in the temperate world, um, that they absolutely wanted to stay. And so after the Panama Canal was finished, 
uh, the Smithsonian scientists and others finance themselves to stay on and create the Canal Zone Biological Station, which is the early version of what you now know as the Smithsonian's Tropical Research Institute, which is, a, one of, which is the finest institute in the world for basic research on the world's tropics and then how that research applies to fundamental human questions such as water, such as biodiversity, etc. And so that's why the Panama Canal is serendipitously so important. It was the reason why the Smithsonian came down. And of course, when the Smithsonian came down, uh, the scientists were hooked on this new and vast biodiversity and these huge changes that the, that, that the uh, experiment, if you like, of the rise of the isthmus had created for biologists both in the sea and on land. And that's how we come to be here today. Um, the slide that's on your screen now um, is, the, is one of the present day locks. Um, and be, obviously, because uh, the canal's design is that you, you go up from the, from the ocean on one side, up two or three steps in each lock till you're 85 feet above sea level, then you cross two thirds of the isthmus on this lake, then you go through a 10 mile cut in the mountains, and then you drop down by three other locks to the other ocean. And the picture you can see here is one of the locks um, on that journey. And what was a, one of the amazing things for me about the canal is how huge people in 1904 or 1908 built the locks. I mean, the, the far sight, the, the, the foresight to see that there were going to be ships that a thousand you know, feet long and 110 feet wide is amazing. And it's only just now that we're having to build a larger set of locks for the super tankers. But up until now, um, this, the, the size of these locks has in fact controlled the size of shipping around the world. Each time a ship goes from one shore to the other, water flows from the lake to an ocean. There's no pumping, it's all done by gravity. And so, the source of water is, is a crucial thing to, to drive the canal. And that's one of the reasons why the biodiversity in the isthmus needs to be retained in the form of vast forests that go from one shore to the other, because those forests act as a, a, a retaining sponge to the water, stop it from eroding and tearing off the, um, the soil, and hence preventing sedimentation of the canal but in, in addition, ensuring that there's a constant supply of water throughout the wet and the dry season. In fact, uh, can any of you guess at how much water actually goes through a lock every time a ship passes from one end through one, one end of it out the other? And you can go ahead and use the box on the left side of the screen to let us know how much water you think flows through when a ship passes through a lock. We'd love to see your votes. Well, people do that. Tony, we, we had a question which I think really is, it came in just a few moments before um, your last remarks. Um, John was asking, I've heard that there's logging in the rainforest near or above the Panama Canal that might affect or lessen the flows of water to the canal, uh, which will eventually cause problems for ships transiting the canal due to, uh, due to this de decrease. Is that true? Um, it is, but not, but for the most part, not within the canal zone. That for, for those who are not aware, the, the, the old treaty that Panama had with the U.S. gave in perpetuity to the United States a zone 10 miles wide that went from the Caribbean to the Pacific. And within that zone, the U.S. did not allow any trees to be cut down, although there's always, there's always leakage and, 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 you know, people that get around it. But basically, it's forested from one side to the other. And um, when the canal was given to Panama in, uh, on 12 o'clock on the 31st of December, 1999, um, Panama had ready a, a rather impressive plan for the use of the old canal zone. And by and large, they've implemented it with remarkable consistency and the canal zone is still 
pretty well protected because the Panamanian government and the Panamanian authorities are well aware of the consequences of sedimentation and disruption of the canal if you were to just cut down the trees. Now, um, what's striking is if you fly over the zone, the second you step outside the zone, everything is deforested. And so um, it is extremely important that the canal retains its, not the old canal zone as under the United States, but it, that some version of it, which is, which is called the, um, the lands that have been referred back to the United States, uh, to, to Panama, excuse me, and those Panama are keeping pretty much forested. So I think that in the crucial areas, the, the, the Cuenca, um, they are doing a reasonable job, but, the, but with an area that large, there's always going to be some people who get away with logging and sneak in and cut and so forth. But I think the Panama is doing a pretty good job in preventing that on a large scale. Thank you for addressing that question. Um, we, we left people on a cliffhanger. Um, the, the votes ranged between 200,000 gallons and 1 billion gallons. Was anybody close? The amount of water flowing through the rock. Well, that's a time. pretty large range. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't mind hedging your bets, but that's sort of ridiculous. Well, I from one person. That was the range of our audience. Right. Um, well, the answer is about uh, 52 million uh, gallons. I wow. think that would run New York City for about 36 hours or something like that. Because that, that, that was 20 years ago, it probably run <laughs> for about 10 minutes now. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the, uh, I think the, 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 what we could perhaps end on is um, uh, what's really interesting, if you look at the slide um, that I've just put on, is that the, the government of Panama have now embarked upon a $5 billion um, upgrade of the canal in order to accommodate for the new generation of super tankers. Um, you may not be aware of the fact that in fact there is a there's a thing called a Panamax vessel and a Panamax vessel is a ship that can just fit through the Panama Canal with about 18 inches to spare on either side and it's sort of vertically sided. It's an ugly looking ship that can carry the maximum amount through the canal. It's not worth building a ship four feet wider. You may as well go from there to a super tanker because if you can't fit through the canal, you've got to go several, you've got to go a long way around uh, the isthmus. I hesitate because I think that's another question we're going to, might try. How much, how long is the distance that's saved by coming through the Panama Canal instead of going around the edge? So um, the government of Panama hatched a plot to um, accommodate for these larger tankers. And there are two problems. One is to straighten and deepen the canal so that these very large vessels could make it round the corners. And then the second thing was to make a set of locks that were big enough to house these vessels. And so you can see on this uh, on the screen, I think it's just moved. Did, that, did I do something? Yeah. Um, the the uh, the new locks, which are very much much larger than the old ones, will in fact use only the same, roughly the same amount of water, and they'll do it by these holding tanks on either side of the lock. And if you look, you can see the the canal on this diagram, and you can see the lock is the narrow bit with the, div the divider in the middle, and on either side are these holding tanks. And so, for the first time, the canal will use lateral pumps to pump the water sideways, hold it in those tanks, and then use the water to refill the locks. So that in the end, these much bigger locks will actually not use any more water than the older locks, uh, even though they're handling much larger um, uh, size ships. And you can see, um, there's a, a model of the lateral um, holding tanks, and I think this uh, th that's the last slide that we have, um, and we can finish on the fact that the, the Panama Canal is going to be an even more spectacular and more comprehensive uh, wonder, modern wonder of the world than it has been in the past.
Excellent. Thank you um, very much for, for weaving together so many important themes that relate to water and biodiversity and the actual history and building of the canal. Um, we're going to sneak in one or two quick questions before we uh, take a very short break and then turn our attention back to Washington, D.C. and thinking about how science and art work together. Um, really, though the canal is a work of art, it seems mm -hmm. from uh, uh, especially as you as you walk us through it. Uh, one of the questions we have um, came in from Larry. Well, what kind of um, evidence do we have, um, if any, th uh, that the engineers during working on the construction of the canal uh, were concerned about ecology and biodiversity? Um, I suspect they were not the slightest bit concerned about ecology and biodiversity. It, it was just something un first of all, the, the, the tropical biodiversity was very poorly understood because um, although the vast majority of all animals and plants live in the tropics, the vast majority of all scientists and, and money and tech education and technical know-how, political will, um, lie in the temperate world. And in fact, uh, the, one of the reasons that the Smithsonian here in Panama is such a powerful body is that it's perhaps the only place in the world that combines first world cutting edge science and its facilities um, with it, resident and, and functioning in the place where the vast diversity of life exists. And that, of course, comes about because of this felicitous um, collaboration that's existed from the beginning um, between the Smithsonian and the Panamanian government. I didn't mention when we were talking about the expedition coming down in 1912. It's 100, exactly 100 years ago. Um, uh, we, that e expedition was originally just going to study the canal zone, but the then president of Panama, um, Pablo Arosimena, thinking um, ahead, suggested, why don't you come and w you would be welcome to study anywhere in, else in Panama. And so the expedition was vastly more uh, fruitful scientifically because it was able to go to the Darien and to Bocas del Toro and to the central mountains and all over Panama and get a much richer sampling than if it had just stayed in the 10 mile wide zone mm -hmm. of the Panama Canal. And so that unsolicited act of friendship, I think, set the tone for the collaboration and the uh, richness of the relationship that exists between the Smithsonian Institution and the government of Panama. And uh, that, 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 um, that's a digression from the question. But the main question is, until that expedition, um, the scientists building the Panama Canal had, had no idea about the tropics and diversity of the tropics. And, and we know from, uh, from photographs of the time that, that all this wonderfully forested area that we live in now in Panama was entirely stripped bare during the construction of the Panama Canal. Oh, it, it's amazing to, to be here uh, on the canal as you tell this story and to have this story being transmitted all across the world. As we said, we have people joining us from Kenya today, from Pakistan, across North America, uh, and even Latin America logged in as well and, uh, and beyond. So we want to um, thank everyone for their, their great questions. Um, a call out to uh, Larry and the earth science students at Becker Middle School who are amazed at the stories and what they've learned today, uh, and so many others for their great comments. Please join me in thanking Sharon Ryan, Dr. Tony Coates, here from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, and Dr. David Pearson from Arizona, Arizona State University, where he is a professor. And uh, 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 we're just delighted to have had you contribute to this talk as well. Thank you all. We'll be back in uh, just about uh, five minutes for our next live session, which will be Science and Symbol, How Water Has Shaped America. We're going to be hearing from Susanna Niepold and Sally Otis, who are educators at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. They not only have some wonderful ways of sharing how they think about this topic with all of us, but as you'd imagine, some wonderful images to help tell that story. We'll see you all in just a few minutes. You can stay right where you are. <laughs>